Hello everyone and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant, hands-on software architect, and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson number 98, we're going to continue our third lesson of architecture roadmaps and this time take a look at the portfolio model. In lesson 96, we took a look at the introduction of a roadmap and we found in lesson 96 that it really consists of three main models. The iteration model, which we looked at in lesson 97, which produces projects that are fed into the portfolio model, which then kind of quantifies and qualifies those projects as well as documentation. And those get sent to a prioritization model, which reprioritizes those projects based on either need, staffing, money, etc., which then ultimately produces the consolidated view. We also saw in 96 how all three of these models are not really independent, but all work together in a synergistic way to be able to create the roadmap. And so that's the complexity involved with roadmapping. Well, in today's lesson, we're actually going to take a look at the portfolio model and have a little fun with a different kind of analogy because the portfolio model really describes the project details associated with the transformation. In our prior lesson, we looked at identifying what needs to happen through those iterations. Now, we fully qualify those, including classification, duration, staffing, size, cost, and documentation of really the details of what needs to happen. Now, one of the interesting things is kind of boring talking about staffing size and cost and duration and that all kind of uh, estimating and stuff like that. But uh, the classification is where things really get interesting because that's where it kind of does sizings and stuff. So uh, we're going to take um, we're going to go back in history uh, to the late 1700s when uh, Britain and France were at war. And this is one of my favorite areas, the whole um, Battle of Trafalgar and the Napoleonic Wars. I'm really fascinated with, as you can tell from not only my reading list on my website, um, but also my bookcase right behind me, <laughs> of which you can see almost half those books have to do with nautical history. <laughs> so we're going to take a step back in time to the late 1700s and take a look at how to classify projects but based on things that were happening then. So I hope I have you intrigued, a little bit of a history lesson, but it's fun. If we take a look at a quadrant like this, there's really four main access points, projects that can be tactical in nature, quick hit, generally technical projects versus those that can be strategic in nature, longer planning, for example. And within the other access, we have projects that are localized within a specific application or department or enterprise-wide that really span those divisions. So within each of these categories, um, we have kind of an interesting thing. So let me show you what's happening here. When we take a look at tactical localized projects, um, I like to call these non-decisive battles. And this terminology I've introduced to many, many, many companies I've been in, and uh, a lot of them have stuck with it, which is really cool. So imagine two ships meeting at sea. All of a sudden, they just find each other, and they battle. Um, is this really going to determine the outcome of the war? No, it's not. That's why I call them non-decisive battles. As a matter of fact, if we look at kind of the attributes when two sheep, ships just meet and start fighting each other, it's generally these kind of projects, if we relate to projects now, are generally technical in nature. They're quick, really inexpensive. Folks, these battles last anywhere from a couple of minutes to maybe 10 minutes. Uh, but there's low risk of these kind of projects. Uh, these non-decisive battles are not going to determine the outcome. However, it does, it does gain morale. Teams get experience as opposed to just firing the cannon off on empty rum barrels for a tot. No, these, this is um, it's a way to gain uh, morale. Um, if we lose a ship, it's not gonna be the end of the world. But these kind of projects resolve localized pain points usually in a transformation and also generate really quick user satisfaction. A good example, here's our enterprise right here, a non-decisive battle it would be a particular project that just isolates that particular application and corresponding database right there. And so you can kind of see if something happens awry, well, the rest of the, rest of the whole enterprise is moving on. And so those are non-decisive battles. Now, if we take a look at tactical and enterprise, kind of, kind of going on the tactical side, 
uh, those are what I usually call decisive battle projects. And these are the kind of projects that could determine or influence the outcome of the war or the initiative. Um, for example, let's take a look at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. And here, this was a fairly decisive battle in the war between England and France. And so when we take a look at what was required, um, they're still tactical in nature because this wasn't really kind of uh, planned, but really it was, well, it was planned on, on the French and Spanish side, but um, not from the British side. So what happened was there wasn't much time to prepare for this. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, uh, if we take a look at some of the characteristics here, uh, like these are tactical, so they're generally technical in nature, um, but like the battles, these decisive battles, uh, they're longer and they're more expensive. Uh, there's an even medium risk because uh, while this may not uh, determine the outcome of the war, uh, it might. And these kind of projects are major projects that if they fail, uh, really put our overall initiative at risk. Um, because they're bigger, more planning is needed, just like the Battle of Trafalgar. We had to, to bring ships in all sorts of different places and get them organized in such a short period of time. Um, so these do generally, these kind of projects, unlike the non-decisive battles that only involve two ships, uh, these involve a lot of ships, a lot of resources, and really are kind of cross-departmental pain points that they're addressing. For example, maybe a project as part of our initiative involves all of these areas in synchronization with one another. And so you can see this is crossing four different departments. So unlike our non-decisive battles, this is going to be a fairly large transformation and hence carries a lot of risk just like those decisive battles. If we kind of move down to the strategic aspect of things, we've got localized strategic. And these, I really like to classify these kind of projects because what I call localized strategic projects are blockades. You know, if you think back during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, blockades were meant really to stifle and shut down a particular port and really kind of just cause that city to crumble down. Ships could not enter, nor could they leave. And so trade and commerce was just brought to a crawl. Uh, ships would rot in their docks and stuff, and people would just leave, and they would go somewhere else. And then the blockade would move elsewhere. That's what blockades were. They were very strategic in nature. There's a lot of planning involved with this. As a matter of fact, if we look at the kind of projects that I like to call blockade projects, and don't forget, these are localized within a particular department, but highly strategic in nature. Um, they're very long and very expensive, folks. So like blockades back in the day, <laughs> no, I know I have gray hair, but I wasn't there. But back in the late 1700s, uh, these, uh, there would not be uncommon to have a blockade duty of several years going back and forth and back and forth. Boy, talk about boring. Um, but there is some medium risk involved with the final out objectives. I mean, this is we're trying to shut down major ports of our enemies. Uh, they do consume a lot of resources, but they're usually scoped like a particular port to a particular department or domain or area. I always made advice um, to folks, um, watch out if you identify yourself on a blockade project. And here's why. If a decisive battle comes about, which we saw last, um, where are those ships going to come from? They're going to come from the blockade, um, which means make sure you have your resume polished, everybody, because the first projects usually to go out the door are the localized strategic ones, the blockades. Those are the first ones to be disbanded. <laughs> so, so watch out if you're on a blockade project. <laughs> and so what we're going to do uh, with a blockade, which is highly strategic, localized strategic, is we're going to take in our entire international portfolio construction area here. And what we're going to do is transform it. And so notice here that this is very strategic in nature for one part, an area of the company doesn't impact all the others, um, but is localized and highly strategic. Lots of transformation happening there. And you might guess now what the enterprise strategic quadrant is. You got it, folks. That's what I call the invasion projects. Yes, where you bring the entire Spanish Armada, the entire fleet uh, together, all the fleets together, as a matter of fact, to do that one final invasion. 
Innovation projects are quite interesting. They're highly strategic in nature. They take years to execute, years to plan. Uh, just like planning an invasion, uh, these projects just last forever. These are the Hail Mary kind of make or break projects. Um, they're extremely high risk. Um, we're kind of betting the farm on these kind of projects, but they do tend to walk up most of the resources and they impact the entire organization. An invasion folks would take a kind of a project and initiative and do this to it. This is either going to work or we will probably shut our doors. <laughs> so within each of these quadrants, we see we've got different ways of classifying different kinds of projects. What most CIOs or some CTOs, mostly CIOs, are really concerned about is what's called their project portfolio. And you can do an analysis of this to take tactical, strategic, localized, and enterprise scope. And here's all the coordinates. What we really want to try to do and what I usually coach and help CIOs achieve is a balanced portfolio, just like in trading. You see, what I've shown here, if 80% of our projects are non-decisive battles, tactical localized, and we've only got 3% invasions, which is probably good, but not many blockades or decisive battles, all we're doing, folks, is fighting fires. And the initiative most likely will not get off the ground. Reverse, non-decisive battles, 3%. Yeah, we don't care about any sort of local pain points. Yeah, don't worry about it. We have vision and we have dreams. 90% of your portfolio is in evasion. Well, it might be indicative of a startup, for example, or a major transformation, but um, again, there's high risk involved here. And what we want to usually strive for, unless it's one of those extremes, is, is a balanced portfolio where we've got some initiatives that really are moving the company in a massive direction like an invasion. But a majority of what we're doing are non-decisive battles to keep our people experienced, happy, and to put out fires, but also address localized pain points, while a good balance between decisive battles and blockades. And so you can kind of, I love this classification because it's a, it's fun, but also if you do read some of that nautical history, it just simply makes sense. So here we have our iteration model that we saw in the last lesson. And what we're gonna do here is take all that sizing classification and what we're going to do is fully qualify these projects with sizings, with cost, with estimates, with documentation, all the classifications so we can identify those decisive versus non-decisive battles versus a blockade, which might be expendable um, or localized. Well, in the next lesson, the last one in our roadmap, we're actually going to look at the prioritization model. And we're going to see how to now prioritize these different projects. And so for some resources, uh, you can certainly go to our book, um, the one I wrote with Neil Ford, um, Fundamentals of Software Architecture, a wonderful book which shows the various dimensions of software architecture, not only the technical aspects, uh, but also the soft skills and techniques of architecture. Um, also my website, developer2architect.com, which has loads of free resources for all of you with these lessons every two weeks. Uh, Neil Ford and I do a free architecture forum, a Q&A online, which you can register for for free. Uh, lots of articles, books, and video references as well. So this has been Lesson 98, Architecture Roadmaps, the Portfolio Model. Uh, hope you enjoyed that little history lesson. Um, and the Lesson 99, um, we're going to take a look at the last model, uh, the prioritization model of roadmaps, and kind of see how all three of these then fit in to constructing an architecture roadmap. So thank you all so much for listening. Stay safe, and uh, we'll talk to you on the next lesson. Bye-bye.